Um, moving on to today's session, we will engage in an interactive scenario exploration exercise looking into possible future AI landscapes and how policymakers can address and manage different risks and seize AI benefits that are highlighted in the different scenarios. Um, this uh, starts to move us from the broad foundational work we've done so far into you know, a tighter uh, focus uh, over the next few meetings. Uh, we have a, a very full agenda today with 28 expert interventions, so let's move right into the program. Uh, and with that, I'd like to give the floor to our uh, expert uh, group co-chairs to briefly introduce themselves. Um, I think starting with Francesca. Francesca, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Thank you, Karin. Um, so, um, I think we should start with uh, our introductions, right? Uh, we, and, and then uh, the presentation of the scenarios by Hamisha Dexter, right, Karin? Yes, exactly. Okay, so I just want to introduce myself now. Uh, I'm Francesca Rossi and I work at IBM Research. I'm the company AI Ethics Global Leader and I'm co-chairing this uh, uh, group on, on AI, um, on, on the AI futures. Um, I think the Stuart and Michael can introduce themselves. Uh, sure, I'm Stuart Russell. I, I know most of you, but it looks like we have some more people on today, uh, a pretty full meeting, so that's great. Um, I teach at Berkeley. Uh, right now I'm sitting in a hotel in Rome and um, we'll finally get back to California tomorrow after about four months on the road. So uh, it's a busy time, I know, for many of you. Thank you for joining. Thank you. My name is Michael Schönstein. I'm head of general digital policy at the German Federal Chancellery, where I coordinate digital um, policy for the German government. Um, so today's session, um, as we heard, will be a scenario exploration exercise. Um, this is um, using scenarios developed on the basis of the expert group discussion so far. Um, before we get there, just one quick remark. Scenarios are not predictions. I always would like to emphasize that very, very strongly. Um, they're very plausible um, e expectations that we can have. And um, I, in, in, in our work, um, we, we usually um, approach scenarios as cognitive stretching exercises that are really there to foster discussion in a structured way. And I think this is a spirit by which uh, we can get through the discussion today um, in a quite uh, good way. With that, I would like to pass the floor to Hamish uh, and Dexter and it'll walk us through the, the uh, scenario inputs. Thank you, over to you. Great, thanks, Michael. Uh, now, so in the last session, we identified six common themes for desirable AI futures. And so we've now developed three AI scenarios to help us explore how these desirable futures might be achieved in different plausible future worlds. Just get us to the right slide. And the issues raised in those scenarios, they've been subject to substantial public debate. So in discussing these scenarios, we're really hoping that we can focus the discussion, uh, bring forth the different assumptions that are driving the different opinions, and move towards consideration of what might be viable policy recommendations that address some of the highest priority risks while enabling the benefits. So to recap briefly on the desirable futures we discussed, uh, firstly, the expert group found that widely distributed AI benefits was a kind of key priority for desirable futures. Similarly, an empowered public with strong democratic and civil society oversight, including investments to reinforce democratic processes. Uh, and third, there were strong technical tools for trustworthy AI, so methods to align AI systems with human values, to ensure safety, to ensure interpretability, transparency, and strong assurance processes to evaluate for dangerous capabilities and for uh, compliance with all of the other items that I just mentioned. Then there were another set of considerations, controls to prevent excess power concentrations, so both corporate power and political subjugation, as well as clear liability rules for AI-caused harms. Then there were controlled training and deployment of high-risk AI models and applications, so 
things like licensing regimes to promote trustworthy AI, um, independent review, enforced disclosure requirements, and red lines for certain use cases. So many of these things will be familiar from some of the uh, action that we've seen from, for instance, the EU AI Act or from the United okay. States Executive Order. And then finally, international cooperation to ensure trustworthy AI. So capable regulatory authorities at the international level, mechanisms to avoid racing with harmful outcomes. Okay. Um, so we're going to now move into the, the meat of this exercise. Um, to reiterate, these scenarios are not predictions or endorsements. Um, they're intended to sort of inspire speculative but constructive thinking about possible futures and illustrate some of the dilemmas in AI policy thinking. So all of the scenarios today combine some of the desirable and some of the undesirable elements. Um, and what we want, we want people to feel free to disagree with some of the underlying assumptions in the scenario. One of the goals of this exercise is to identify and challenge these assumptions to help us build more robust foundations for forward-looking AI policy. And with that, we're going to kick you off with the first of the scenarios, which we've titled Benevolent Oligopoly. Um, this is a world where AI capabilities and global AI governance is overseen by a handful of companies in advanced economies. Um, so high development costs, talent constraints, and regulatory barriers concentrate cutting-edge AI in a handful of companies. Dominant firms offer access of their, to their technologies as a paid service that is highly valuable to customers who can afford it, and boosting their productivity and well-being for large numbers of people. Firms defend with tight control their models on safety grounds, citing evidence that guardrails on open source, uh, open source models can be fairly easily overridden. Um, so the, and, and in this world, not only is the AI startup ecosystem lagging behind dominant firms, um, but the digital divide persists. Smaller and developing countries have less access to cutting edge AI and are forced to accept governance decisions of leading firms in other in advanced economies, um, leading to including the potential uh, dis judgments calls on biases uh, um, in those countries and companies. For this first scenario, we have two questions. The first is a fairly simple, you know, what are the, the risks and benefits from AI that you would expect to manifest in this future? And the second one, getting more into the policy considerations, is you know, how can governments ensure sufficient democratic oversight and distribution of the benefits of AI? Hamish for the second. Uh, so for the second scenario, we have a scenario titled Democratized Benefits and Distributed Risks. So this is a scenario in which open source models lead to mixed impacts. So open sourcing proves to be the best business model for cutting edge AI. Barriers to entry are much lower than in the other scenario, and there's a vibrant open source community that supports both free and paid AI products and services. Large companies still have closed source models, but there's competition from open source alternatives, so this mitigates some of the power concentration concerns. Uh, but on the kind of downside, open source AI is being used to enable disinformation, fraud, cyber attacks, and there's even concerns about bioweapon development. And on, but then on, back on the positives, the open source AI ecosystem also produces tools to support trustworthy AI. So we see debiasing techniques being developed. We see novel innovation to create more trustworthy AI. For this scenario, we're asking the same question. Uh, what risks and benefits from AI might we expect to materialize? And then how can governments best manage the risks in this scenario? And uh, third and last, we're going to a scenario that explores really one of the most controversial topics that came up in our, our survey of experts. And we're calling this one pulling the plug. This is a future where a regulator calls for implementing a global moratorium on further development of specific cutting edge systems. So training of high impact AI systems in OECD countries in this future is controlled via, via a risk-based licensing regime enforcing safety, privacy, and ethical rules. But this is a deal among OECD economies. So large non-OECD countries, BRICS countries, a lot of the global majority, are not members of the oversight regime. 
their AI capabilities are, are, are near in some cases, but certainly behind, uh, but a little bit behind the cutting edge. A regulator in a large OECD country determines that a critical safety threshold could be surpassed and prohibits an AI project, sort of like a training run by a leading AI lab. OECD leaders are briefed that the lab's AI systems are approaching human levels of general intelligence and insufficient safeguards are in place and development of certain cutting edge AI models may need to be ceased indefinitely. And in this, and, and there's fundamental questions about how this can be, how this can be achieved given there is no fully agreed upon global AI governance and safety consensus. Um, the questions for this one are slightly different, um, but it's for the first it's, you know, what might the criteria be for pulling the plug on certain types of cutting edge AI development? And then the su second sort of, and sub questions on this are, you know, what is the system needed to manage large scale loss of control risks? What systems would needed to be implemented in order to stop specific types of AI development? Who would need to be involved in making such a decision? And what would be the sort of what what would be necessary to ensure sufficient global agreement on pausing specific types of AI development? With that, we're handing back to, to chairs to get into the exploration of these scenarios. Thanks, uh, Hamish and Dexter. Uh, so let's now start uh, discussing scenario one. Uh, the you may remember this is about the benevolent uh, oligopoly scenario. So overall, today we have, uh, as Karin said, 28 members that would like to intervene. So we really need to be very strict in time. And we ask that each of our members speak stick to three minutes each maximum. So I will be the bad guy here and I will try to keep you on time on the under the three minutes. And uh, of course, members can also email the OECD with any additional thoughts after the, the session. I'm sure that all of you have more than many more than three minutes to, to say useful things for the discussion of these scenarios, but you can email that. Um, let's start with our members that are joining uh, virtually. So uh, I would like to start asking uh, Sarah Myers West, the managing director of the AI Now Institute, to intervene. Thank you very much. Um, so in thinking about this scenario, you know, what really struck me is that the oligopoly that it describes in many ways describe, also depicts the current state of affairs. Um, and, and not only that, but we really would not have arrived on the current version of AI if it was not for existing high levels of concentration in the tech industry, and, and that raises significant concerns. But let me unpack that a little bit. Um, AI has meant many different things over the course of an almost 70 year history, but it's in its current form, it can be characterized as applied statistical techniques um, that involve you know, using huge swaths of data scraped from the web or obtained through commercial surveillance and massive amounts of computational power used to process it. The underlying technological techniques date back to the late 1980s, but the resources that are needed to build large-scale AI and the incentive structures that are shaping this market really track to the emergence of big tech firms. So concentration in AI is a feature rather than a bug. And that's a massive problem because not only because it's harmful for small d democracy, for a few big firms to amass this amount of economic power. It's also a problem because of the specific ways, <laughs> excuse me, AI is used out in the world. The incentives of the, of the market left unchecked are leading to deepened inequality as AI is used to entrench power in the hands of the powerful and to uh, justify austerity measures. And many of the companies involved are engaged in a race to the bottom, engaging in toxic competition as they rush AI systems into commercial use without using sufficient independent or robust scrutiny or pre deployment testing. So, this is AI's present rather than its future. And indeed, absent a comprehensive regulatory apparatus or strong competition enforcement, startups are finding themselves hamstrung because they're tied to the resources only a few firms own and control. Governments are too. While they announce public infrastructure investments, as a rule, these public funds are likely 
um, ultimately going to flow to a couple of incumbent firms that are located predominantly in global north countries. We need to seriously take stock and consider how to ensure that AI serves the interests of the public and not just a few big companies. The path forward, as was made very clear in the conversations around a policy, AI policy last week um, at the, the UK summit, um, in the White House announcements, um, the path forward must involve strong regulation of this sector, including mandatory accountability measures, data privacy and data minimization, and swift and strong enforcement by competition officials. We saw good signals on this last front through the G7 today, through the statement from competition authorities on AI. And it's crucial that we that in global governance forums, we go beyond looking at bias, risk, and disinformation to also address the issue of concentration in the AI industry at the G7, in the new UN high-level group in, on AI, and in other global governance principles. Can you, can you conclude? It's already over three minutes. Okay, last, last sentence. Absent these, any accountability measures, whether voluntary, red teaming, or open source development, or public investments will ultimately serve to entrench the status quo, not to meaningfully shape AI's future tra trajectory. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. Okay, so let's pass to the second member, um, Ellen Toner, Director of Strategy and Foundational Research Grants at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology. Ellen? Thank you, Francesca. Yeah, echoing Sarah, I mean, clearly this scenario was the closest to the current world that we have. And I think the concerns that Sarah raised about um, the harms of concentration of power and that being the trend that we're on are all absolutely right. Um, to respond to kind of the two questions, first risks and benefits, and then um, potential government, government interventions, I mean, I think this scenario has one key benefit to it, um, which is not to say that, you know, the benefits outweigh the risks, but the key benefit here is um, that with a smaller number of actors and with the sort of most sophisticated developers being in well-regulated jurisdictions, um, you have a greater ability to coordinate the, the major AI developers, um, greater ability to regulate them relatively, you know, regulate them firmly. Um, and less incentive for those developers to um, to cut corners, potentially. Um, you know, you have greater ability to impose risk management requirements, including you know mandatory audits, um, strict regulations around uh, risk management practices, potentially things like external you know uh, implanting external government observers into the companies, the way is is done in in the banking sector, for example. Um, uh, setting red lines beyond which development should not proceed, sort of related relevant to, to um, the, the third scenario here, um, requiring, you know, that that companies make a positive safety case, you know, starting from scratch and making a, an, an affirmative assurance case for why what they're doing is safe the way that we require in other safety critical industries. You know, many of these practices, which are a long way from standard practice today, and that could potentially be implemented in a scenario like this. So that's sort of the primary or main single benefit for, of a scenario like this. Um, obviously, there are many potential risks and harms, uh, a huge one being uh, lack of access by by most people in the world and, and by many, you know, marginalized and less well-resourced groups. Um, you also, I think, have a real risk of AI in this scenario being used for sort of empty or commercial purposes, like building, you know, internet apps that get eyeballs, um, rather than having AI be used to solve global challenges, which is, you know, the kind of thing that, that really motivates, I think, many people to, to want to develop AI in the first place. Um, consolidation of power brings all kinds of different risks and harms alongside it. Sarah spoke well to that, so I'll move quickly through that. Um, I think there are also geopolitical risks here. Uh, if you have China or other countries um, feeling threatened, feeling left behind, um, there's concerns around how they might react. In terms of how governments can ensure sufficient democratic oversight and distribution of benefits, I mean, there are some obvious things here. One is uh, to tax these companies highly, um, to use those taxes to subsidize access, subsidize research, um, uh, you know, allow populations that might not have access to the technology to benefit from it. Um, I think there are also possibilities to explore uh, ways to mandate that democratic input should shape certain properties of the AI systems being built. I know, you know, there's some exploration of how to do this already, and I think there's much more that could be done. Um, and uh, and then, you know, in addition to sort of ensuring oversight and distribution of benefits, there's also, uh, again, a lot of kind of risk management measures that that could be taken here. Um, I'll leave it there to try and stay within the time limit, but thanks very Thank much you. for including Thank me. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you. Um, so the next one is Charles Fadel, the founder and chairman of the Center for Curriculum Redesign. Charles? 
Yes, thank you. And I have my timer. I'm starting now for three minutes. Okay, so um, I'm gonna address uh, first of all, what do we mean by uh, by benevolent oligopoly? Uh, there are examples out there. I can ITU and even Linux. Uh, we or even on the negative, on the scary side, IAEA for nuclear weapons. So. They don't. They don't need to be controlled by a corporation. They can be uh, that sort of company, and that's why I wanted to speak in this trend, even though these comments relate to the next one. That's what would make something uh, actually uh, benevolent. Uh, would you really trust the values of Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk? Um, but you do trust the values of Linus Torvalds. That's the, the problem here is that it's really at the end, the values of the individual that runs these places that uh, imparts the values to how uh, these are benevolent or not. And so that's that's the, the, the first difficulty. The second one is the dollar's intensity. I mean, the investment intensity here, uh, developing an operating system is nowhere near as expensive as developing an LLM. So in any case, these are the things that you have to grapple with. Uh, obviously, social media companies are a great example of what not to do and not to trust in terms of benevolent oligopoly. Then let's talk about uh, AI capabilities. Uh, the recent fiasco with autonomous vehicles has been actually happening over years, but now has become even more acute, shows that uh, it is really, really, really going to be complex to get to AGI. And as much as I understand everyone here in being interested in AGI and ASI, I think we should listen a little bit more to Azim Azhar and Mustafa Suleiman, Azim being on this call, and talk a bit more about ACI, you know, what are the capabilities today that we need to pay attention to, not the only the future capabilities. So to the two questions, as long as, for the first question, as long as we have a truly open LLM initiatives, uh, alternatives, um, that will force a rebalancing of power, even between Lama and Falcon and Mistral, we're already seeing this uh, jockeying for uh, openness, and that's gonna keep some of the bad behavior in check. Uh, second, we have funded things like CERN or on the not so pleasant side, Eurofighter, et cetera. Why not LLMs? Problem is governments are too slow, and that's one of the things to grapple with. Technology happens in, on a daily basis here. Uh, governments uh, work on a yearly basis. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Um, the next one is Caroline Hushors, a Turing Research Fellow with the Alan Turing Institute. Lovely, thank you. Um, so like others who've already spoken, um, yes, I saw many parallels between this scenario and where we are today. And in particular, I wanted to pick up on these two points. One about this large uh, concentration of power, resources and influence from a small number of players. And secondly, this idea of uh, huge barriers to participation by certain groups, uh, including Global South countries who will be impacted uh, but can't shape the, the technologies or oversight. So to very quickly just mention some of the risks uh, regarding concentration of power. So firstly, uh, the risk of substantial control of key products and infrastructure uh, can mean that sectors, governments and individuals become highly dependent on individual firms. Uh, and this can result in undemographic decisions about key infrastructure, lack of meaningful consent uh, and difficulties in governments making uh, meaningful changes, uh, which can only get harder over time. Um, and in particular, if, if these are information sharing technologies that we're talking about, um, then individual companies uh, can strongly shape how the world is seen and understood by huge populations at scale. Uh, and this can have huge risks for uh, democracy, misinformation, autonomy, mental well-being, human relationships uh, and more. Um, and finally, this influence can mean that big tech can shape, uh, if not to define the narrative, uh, around risks and mitigations, um, shaping these to fit those that serve their interests. And then regarding um, Global South participation, so companies um, may only be incentivized to invest in harm uh, mitigation for certain languages and certain populations, i.e. particularly where policymaker, shareholder and, and PR attention uh, are focused. 
Uh, and this when global south countries are already not getting the, the benefit financially and are likely to be amongst the most exploited in the global supply chain for these technologies, for example, through uh, exploitative data work or, or content moderation work, uh, etc. So very quickly, uh, what can be done? So just, just two points to mention here. So firstly, uh, the need for global cooperation that truly centers the voice <coughs> and impacts to uh, global South countries, seeking impactful mitigations for all uh, to avoid this outsourcing of harms. And secondly, uh, not allowing big tech to shape the narrative and actions around risk evaluation, mitigation and oversight. So in my view, civil society, the public and other groups should be setting the agenda around risk evaluation, mitigation and oversight, uh, not big tech. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Um, now we go to Conrad Tucker, Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. Thank you, everyone, and uh, good day. I am calling in from uh, Kigali, Rwanda, where I'm currently serving as the Interim Director of CMU Africa. So I have a hands-on perspective of the Global South's uh, involvement in this conversation of AI. So CMU Africa uh, has over 300 students where we're focusing on uh, educating the next generation of AI experts. So when, we, when it comes to the potential benefits, there is an immediate opportunity for this uh, benevolent oligopoly to standardize what we teach and for our students to uh, then go on to uh, different tech sectors where the knowledge that they gain can uh, easily be uh, deployed because there's that interoperability. Um, I think this also ties into the ability to, um, for those students who graduate to then serve as uh, educators in the organizations that they, uh, they, they go on to. Uh, many of them stay on the African continent. And so the idea here is that uh, by having um, students who are educated in the uh, standard AI um, uh, algorithms that they can, they then go on to educate others in industry. Um, some of the risks I'm going to focus on on trust. So we we talk about the open source, um, the availability of, of open source models, which are, are great. But for many of these pre-trained models, it'd be very difficult to retrain from scratch. So in resource constrained environments, just the ability to verify the uh, the veracity of the the training data sets. Uh, may be uh, an onerous burden that is placed on uh, resource constrained environments. Um, so what can be done to mitigate both the, the trust uh, constraint and also the, um, the difference in, in resource accessibility? I propose um, that we invest more in uh, student exchanges or, or knowledge exchanges in general, where we have more of the Global North uh, spending time physically in countries where we would like to have more um, interoperability and, and knowledge exchange. So uh, with that, I would like to um, cede my time and thank you for the opportunity to speak from uh, Rwanda. Thank you. Thank you, Conrad. Um, the next one is Azim Azar, for the founder of Exponential View. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Francesca. Uh, when I uh, looked at this scenario, um, I, I thought about it through the lens of uh, the, the relationship between the benevolent oligopolies and uh, the power of the state. Uh, and looking out, um, I imagined a risk that I call the, the SOMA uh, algorithm, uh, which is uh, building on some of the, the, the risks and, and behaviors we've seen over the last five or 10 years as technology has been concentrated in a few decision-making firms. Um, and extending it through the notion of uh, conformity engineering, uh, that as uh, AI becomes both the infrastructure upon which services can be built, um, and therefore the limits that, that those services can express, and it becomes the interface by which we can access resources, uh, it creates a risk of conformity engineering that emerges between the interests of the big tech 
or the big firms that are providing the technologies and the capabilities um, and the interests of the elites uh, that will form the, the backbone of the political power, particularly in uh, various countries. Um, and that intersection uh, creates a, a natural uh, opportunity for there to be some sort of, of coalition which may seem to serve the democratic interest, it may seem to serve the, uh, the citizen as agent, but may actually be a hall of mirrors and, and create an illusion of, of control. Um, and I think that we've started to see a, a, a few hints of this. We've seen them historically, of course, uh, but one in, in the recent um, regulations that came out of China around uh, LLM output and the degree to which there needs to be political conformity of that, that output. So in my scenario of the, the SOMA algorithm, which is about the intersection between corporate sovereignty and elite power and about AI as both the interface and the infrastructure for the access and delivery of services. Um, the, the question is, you know, how does one uh, address that risk? Um, and it, it comes through a number of different uh, ways. One is starting to rethink what we think of as a commons or a public good or a social good rather than a, uh, a, a private service. The second, which is related, is to ask questions about structural separation between things that are foundational or utility um, and things that are application. Um, and the third is, you know, what is the mechanism for observing uh, and uh, understanding how these systems are behaving, which is the requirement for transparency and how do we construct a competitive uh, environment for that transparency, which may involve civil society or may involve other types of institutional designs. Um, I'm happy to stop there and pass the time on to someone else. Thanks, Azim. Thank you. So now we have Joshua Bencho um, from Mila. Joshua, you, you are welcome to in be included in with a short intervention. Yes. Uh, so this is about power concentration in a few companies in exchange for greater safety. And I don't think it has to be an either or. Um, uh, we need to deal both with the national security or loss of control risks uh, that come with open source and uh, deal with the, uh, the issue of power concentration. And I think as being mentioned, if we can change the oversight to make it stronger as the um, democratic oversight as the capabilities of these systems uh, increase. And in the limit, uh, this might mean uh, doing something equivalent to nationalizing these frontier AI labs when the power that they have in their hands is just too large. Um, and the potential conflict of interest between their commercial uh, uh, interest and humanity's interest uh, is not acceptable. Um, and of course, we have to include all the voices, especially of Global South, civil society, uh, academics, not just the government of the country where the lab is, uh, we need to organize that uh, governance so that uh, it's not also a single country doing it, but somehow we uh, have a multilateral um, acceptance of these uh, governance mechanisms. I'll stop here. Thanks, thanks, Josh. So uh, let's now shift to the members uh, who should be in the room and they were able to join uh, a meeting in Paris today. So the first one in, is Aaron Maniam, Fellow of Practice and Director of Digital Transformation Education at Blavatnik, Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. Aaron? Thank you very much. Um, I find the school's name difficult to pronounce as well, so, so not to worry on that front. Um, I have four C's that I wanted to share today um, that what struck me as I went through the scenarios. Um, the first is China. Um, so far only Azim has really mentioned it, and I do think we need to ask ourselves, how do we get out of a you know, purely Western window uh, or bubble in, in this scenario? What is happening in China as all of this concentration happens? And I think there are lessons that can come out of you know, the users and applications that they're using AI for, even as we think about the risks that emerge from things like the social credit system. Uh, I won't go into details now, but I'm happy to work with the team on where the China angle can be fleshed out even further, because I do think it's a, it's a notable omission in, in this scenario. Um, second C is Conway's Law, uh, you know, the idea in programming that organizations adopt technology in ways that mirror their existing communication structures rather than genuinely transforming. Uh, and I think it's worth asking ourselves even with this benevolent oligopoly, what is actually going to happen to AI? Um, 
And are we actually just going to perpetuate existing inequalities and power structures? Uh, this, I think, is why the, the regulation that Sarah and Helen especially talked about becomes so important, because I suspect what will end up happening is we will need to put in all, the, all sorts of regulations precisely because AI becomes so much more pervasive and, and prevalent. Um, there's a phrasing that we use in public policy that any tool sharp enough to be worth having is also sharp enough to be worth regulating. And this scenario seems to be one of those where AI will need that sort of, of deep in interventions. Um, Third C is on capacity, both human and institutional. And this, this scenario made me think a lot about whether or not we have the right capacities to respond to this sort of very, very pervasive uh, AI. Um, and, and one question there is at the individual level, do people have the skills to play well in this sort of space? Do they have the right education? And do they, once they move into employment, have the right sorts of skills and training supported by governments if necessary to actually meaningfully exist when the acts of daily living are mediated so much by AI? Um, and then at the level of institutions, I think it's worth us asking whether our institutions are actually ready to deal with the consequences of such pervasive uh, artificial intelligence. I think we need to think a lot more about governments banding together, some kind of combined Brussels-Paris effect, because there's a lot that governments cannot do alone in this respect, but that they can do if they find ways to, to collaborate. Uh, and then finally, the fourth thing. So, um, Citizens uh, and consultation, I think, are important here as well. Um, how do they, what is the role that individuals have in this world? Um, because even if, if there is concentration, we also need to think about where exactly the roles that citizens are going to play uh, will exist. And do they need some kind of pushback towards corporations precisely because there is so much power concentrated in companies? So China, Conway's Law, Capacity, and Citizens. Thanks. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks. So the next one is uh, Juraj Korba, Senior Expert at Digital Regulation and Governance at the Slovak Ministry of Investment, Regional Development and Informatization. Juraj. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, many important things were already mentioned, so I will limit myself just a few thoughts. Um, basically, um, we are discussing here the scenario of a uh, benevolent oligopoly and uh, the question that I have in my mind in relation to this is actually um, all our thinking about um, the oligopoly as we know it is based on a market analysis as we have developed it over past uh, 100 or 200 years. Um, the question I would like to raise in this connection is, is um, the following issue. Um, we are addressing the issue of AI capabilities, but this is not a single economic sector that we are uh, dealing with. Um, the AI capabilities will cut across many different economic sectors. And um, the question there is, of course, then how the big players will be able to even leverage further their position on the market um, across the various domains. And uh, in that respect, we may even need to uh, reconsider or um, uh, redesign our market analysis and our thinking about the markets as such. And maybe one of the possible inspirations uh, for this exercise uh, is the, is the um, analysis uh, done by uh, institutions, global institutions and regional institutions in the field of finance, where they move uh, uh, in their market analysis and systemic risks analysis from a focus on uh, uh, market um, activities into focus on uh, entities and their ability to cut across various domains. Uh, so these are uh, my few thoughts that I would like to share with you and it, it also touches upon the um, China experience where we have strong uh, players, although we know that there were some regulatory uh, steps taken by the Chinese government, but of course the ultimate dream of every economic player is to uh, devise a digital product, a single icon uh, in your uh, mobile phone through which you may um, f f uh, access various services across digital finance, uh, entertainment and many other fields. So. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, the food for thought is, are we actually applying 
the right market analysis or, or do we need to reconsider our tools that we have available? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, now we are going to do something a bit disruptive in the flow of discussion because uh, we are going to let Rebecca Finlay from the Partnership on AI intervene on scenario two. So remember, scenario two is about the uh, democratized benefits and distributed risks because she has to leave uh, uh, very soon. Rebecca, do you want to intervene now? Thank you very much, Francesca, and I apologize for the disruption. I did not intend to do that, and I want to welcome the opportunity to participate in this thought exercise and just articulate that it's from that perspective that I'm enjoying and analyzing these scenarios. With regard to the open source scenario that we have in front of us, um, I'd like to refer, there's a great paper uh, that's been released by the Center for Governance on AI with regard to looking at open sourcing foundation and frontier models that I recommend to you all, as well as some work done by Madhus Rakumar in my organization around safe foundation model deployment. So the benefits are clear with regard to widening the competitive landscape for innovation, drawing out innovative new models that can really deploy AI with regard to healthcare, the uh, climate change, all sorts of the ways in which we think about the transformative potential for AI stretching across markets into small to medium sized enterprises, but also more globally. I think one of the other uh, benefits with regard to open source models is the capacity to work with open science and publicly funded science in more direct ways to better understand the capacity of these models as they grow, as well as to better understand the science of risk management and risk measurement and risk evaluation that we all know is central to thinking about how we manage the development of these models moving forward. And then thirdly, a benefit may be the capacity to build up an entire ecosystem of uh, businesses and civil society organizations and associations that are focusing on evaluating models early and assessing risk and auditing and providing some level of transparency prior to the deployment of these models. And then, of course, the risks are that these models could be used maliciously um, and the concerns around how and, in fact, the risk assessment is happening uh, prior to deployment with regard to iterating through the safe deployment of these large-scale models in an open way. And those clearly are of significant concern. With regard to governments, um, governments are going to need to build the capacity to provide appropriate oversight with regard to this. There's all sorts of ways in which regulation, liability laws, licensing uh, and penalties could be used uh, from, a, from a regulatory perspective as well, not least of which is both domestic and national jurisdiction responses, but also internationally with regard to uh, cybersecurity and other high-risk security measures. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay, so now we go back to scenario one, and the next member that uh, can intervene is Dan Fagella. Uh, founder and head of research of Emergy AI Research. Dan? All right, great. Um, I've got my timer rocking for two minutes and 45 seconds. Um, uh, I give a lot of credit to the OECD for putting some great topics on the table. I think it's it's amazing to see that we're staying ahead of future-related themes, and I'm, I'm glad to be able to, to do a bit of that today. Um, because we're pretty limited on time, I'm going to squelch what I have for the risks side of this discourse um, and talk about the, the potential benefit around coordination. I think if there were a status quo that went well, I think it might be easier to have an oligopoly that plays by a shared set of rules than a completely open sourced, uh, sort of open to anybody ecosystem um, to uh, be able to uh, abide by, let's say, the OECD's AI principles. Um, so there, there's clearly some benefit of potential coordination, but I, I think some of the risks and some of the additional considerations on governance, I'm gonna bring up two that I think are valid. One of them is around, you know, there's a lot of talk around obsolescence in the workforce, and the OECD has a strong focus on sort of preparing for the future of the labor market. Um, I think obsolescence is one part of it, but we had our, our uh, good man a moment ago talking about this idea of SOMA. I think that escapism uh, is another part of it. I think that it is possible that some of the existing big tech players, not because of malice, but just by the incentives at play, um, I think there's a lot of versions of the world with people swimming in really immersive uh, 
virtual ecosystems, AI conjured ecosystems that are generated to be astronomically more entertaining, uh, better for learning, maybe even better for bonding with virtually conjured entities than the real world. Um, and I think there's a possibility for that to, to kind of pull people away from agency and from their own goals. Right now, Netflix's main goal is to you know, prevent us from, from getting sleep and watching more Netflix. And again, I'm not blaming them for that. But I think that if we carry that forward with the power of what Gen AI might do, uh, preventing escapism might be valid. Last thing I'll put on the table here is around um, sort of the ends to which we're working. I, I think if we, we talk about the word trajectory a lot, uh, it, we all want AI to be safe. Uh, we all want AI to be transparent. But to what end? Let's say we had an oligopoly or whatever the, the amalgam is. Um, what's the future we want to move towards? I think there are some people who are eager for brain-computer interface as soon as humanly possible, and they see the progression of AI and being able to level humanity up. Uh, I think there's other folks that want AI to be an eternal babysitter of humanity and others that want AI to do things as far into the galaxy and as distant from our imagination as what we do are from the imagination of Labrador Retrievers. Um, I suspect that there is an elephant in the room around to what end. So whether we do the oligopoly or another amalgam, um, great, two years from now we're all safe. We can all agree that's good. <coughs> What's the farther future going to be? What do, we, what do we want for the future of intelligent machines and humanity? I think some of that discourse might be handy in thinking about what the best governance structure is, and that's it for my time. Thank you, Dan. Uh, okay, so the next one is Emmanuel Cahembue, uh, CEO of VDE, VDE UK. Um, hello. Um, yeah, uh, most of the things, points I wanted to raise have already been raised, so I'm more likely going to pose questions here about uh, this whole idea of... Uh, you know, a benevolent oligopoly. Uh, when I when I read that, I think of like AI feudalism. Like uh, think about feudalism in the digital age. You know, empowered by AI. Um, and regardless of if it's benevolent or not, uh, I'm not sure if this is something that is, you know, overall. Even when we think about the goals of AI and all the nice things we want to have with regard to you know the future of AI, if uh, this is a path that's viable. Um, uh, secondly, uh, I mean, there was, they already touched on this whole idea of consolidation. Um, and that's a problem there because you have, you know, uh, consolidation of power into a limited amount or a, li a limited diversity of views, you know, uh, in these oligopolies. And so then you have to consider whose interests are, are considered in this discussion. Uh, most of these oligopolies would be, you know, uh, have a mandate to their investors, which means that it would be driven by profits. So, you know, um, there's those considerations there. Um, and then there's also, like touching again on this feudalism kind of idea is that, that there's gonna be this pinnacle of, you know, uh, a few companies that we serve our data up to and, you know, in return, they give us AI systems that uh, improve our lives. Uh, and then we assume that everyone's happy to sign up to this. You know, that's like a decision we're making for everybody there. Uh, so again, uh, I'm not really a fan of that. Um, with regard to what governments can do, I think there is an aspect of government education uh, internally within governments. Uh, I think that uh, we have I've seen governments becoming more sa savvy about data privacy, for example, you know, uh, and GDPR and the rest. And I think that with a technology such as AI, if it becomes as pervasive, if it, can continue, if it continues to become as pervasive as it is right now, it would be useful for governments to actually, you know, have some, I don't know, some kind of update course or something for their own employees so that they actually, uh, their own personnel so that they actually know what they're talking about. Uh, uh, there is a small section that do, but I would say the majority still kind of think of it as quite a foreign idea. Um, there was the mention of transparency. I think that that should be touched upon again, is that uh, some entity should have the ability to see what's going on, you know, outside of the, all the companies that are, you know, outside of the, you know, the select companies that are on this pedestal, there should be some government entity that's able to open up the books and see everything from beginning to end, you know, from development to release, uh, and ensure that uh, companies are, you know, behaving, I guess. Attached to that is, attached to that is this idea of penalties and fines, it was mentioned earlier, but they have to be set at the level which actually matters. You know, if they're, you know, if it's something that, uh, you know, if we get caught, it's a slap on the wrist. You know, uh, most, I guess, uh, quite a few companies would be willing to take that risk. 
Uh, and the last bit, and this is a, more on the beneficial side, is I think governments should set goals for what they want from AI, you know, based on their own societies. Be like, we want, I don't know, uh, some moonshot project with regard to AI in healthcare. Uh, can this be done? Uh, and, you know, set this as a national goal uh, for all the companies and research labs. And I think that would help a lot in shaping the direction that AI takes uh, from a governmental level. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we are finished with scenario one. So I would like to thank all our speakers for this scenario and Rebecca also for the intervention on scenario two. And now I'd like to pass things to Stuart to facilitate further discussion on scenario two. Thank you, Francesca. Um, so just to remind you, scenario two is the one where uh, there's a proliferation of open source AI systems, which creates uh, some benefits and also creates some, some risks and problems for regulation. Um, so uh, Rebecca has already spoken. Um, we're going to start with people in the room. And uh, Sebastian Hallensleben, who's uh, chair of Sen Senelec. Um please go ahead. Thank, thank you very much. Um... I'll start off by highlighting a benefit of the open source scenario. Financial models are spawning a whole ecosystem. Uh, organizations are refining the training. Organizations are building whole applications on top of models. And we see new services uh, based on generative AI coming out almost hourly. <coughs> so this is a testament to the great usefulness of financial models, but it also creates dependencies and usually multiple layers of dependencies. And what if the provider of a model disappears? What if the provider of a model changes commercial strategy and discontinues the model? What if the provider of a model goes bankrupt? What if the provider of a model makes changes? We've seen that this uh, happens earlier in the year when sp people started noticing that uh, GPT or ChatGPT behaves differently and gives different answers because OpenAI made some changes in the background, maybe for security, maybe for uh, resource usage, we don't know. In an open source scenario, we have far greater resilience. Once a model is out there as open source, it will always be available. And resources to improve the model will always be available as long as there is an interest in it, regardless of whether it's a commercial or a non-commercial interest. And therefore, in an open source scenario, organizations will have far more confidence in depending on those models and we can therefore expect a broader ecosystem and potentially a faster and or broader pace of innovation. So what does it mean for governments to have an open source scenario? As has been pointed out, open source models are far more difficult to regulate and therefore regulation might not be the most powerful lever that governments have in this scenario. A good example are AI automated disinformation and bots that are almost impossible to, to regulate. Therefore, the focus of government in this scenario should be on fostering adjacent and complementary open source activities. So, for example, including and developing tools for increasing the resilience of the digital space, tools to build digital trust, for example, as, as a being fostered by the OECD in the global challenge on trust in the age of generative AI. And following the earlier intervention from uh, Jura uh, um, to the previous scenario, um, if we foster the prototyping of a broader spectrum, we can also think about uh, models for creating and curating digital content that go beyond the current de facto standards of having free content paid by advertising and data. And again, this is a lever that is outside of regulating AI, but will help provide the space and the freedom for an open source generative AI ecosystem to flourish. Thank you. Thank you very much, keeping well the time. Uh, and next is Amir Banifatimi, who's co-founder of AI Commons. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you, everyone. Uh, to follow what Sebastian mentioned, uh, and not to paraphrase what he said, uh, I would like to emphasize the benefits that uh, open source can provide from a, a societal and democratization AI perspective, uh, assuming that is agreeable on, under this uh, scenario that uh, open source is a good thing to, to promote trust 
and transparency and improve public trust in general around AI systems. Um, in that scenario, I would like to propose um, an approach of investment. An investment would use the, uh, the image of a J-curve, where we start investing uh, with some depth at the beginning to reap some larger benefit and, and uh, massive growth at the end. And this investment could be viewed as a social, regulatory, and economic investment, just to emphasize that. Uh, the benefits and, and risk have been mentioned in the scenario. I would like to emphasize probably a 10 to 15 years uh, time frame where in the short term we're going to have some disruption and difficulty to manage and regulate the risk, as was before mentioned. But uh, gradually some of the uh, benefits could be uh, waived in and, and beneficially viewed. And um, the scenario of having some adjacent uh, open source effort to put the public good could be welcome. Uh, and with some initial investment, the long-term benefit of open source can actually be demonstrated. Um, in terms of what governance can do, obviously there is un unintended consequences of using open source models, but they also need to probably bring the notion of bad actors. Bad actors are determined to manipulate and use technology in certain ways, so regulatory approaches might not be uh, applicable, and probably sharper and more stringent mechanisms need to be in place. So what I'd like to propose in this scenario is to um, um, provide mechanisms to accept uh, more widely open source and embrace it by governments, but having a social willingness to adapt this rapid change and embrace it and <coughs> accept the risks, but also provide resources and expertise both at the government level to provide safety mechanism and oversight, uh, and also balance the openness uh, with some thoughtful uh, oversight at each stage. Um, and finally, uh, shaping incentives and norms to collectively bring responsibility to various communities that to embrace those, those open source approaches. So um, uh, I think with both dedicated efforts, uh, we can accept this scenario as one way to really engage into uh, the democratization of AI in a way that, as I mentioned before, which needs to be uh, defined in the common good. Thank you. Thanks, Emir. Uh, next is uh, Clara Neppel uh, from IEEE. Thank you. Um, so I would like to uh, build up on what uh, Sebastian said. That um, well, traditionally we uh, we know that uh, open source uh, offers a competition model, which is. Uh, which is good for innovation. It is good also for uh, solving uh, global challenges. Uh, and basically it is based on pooling resources from uh, different organizations to build that open source model and uh, the open source code and, uh, and to build up on it uh, to um, have uh, differentiation and also value creation. Uh, and, um, and with this, we see this very uh, successfully uh, with Linux and with other open source models. However, I would like to draw the attention that we have a difference here when we talk about foundational models because when we're talking about foundational models it's a pre-trained model so there's a difference when we come uh, when we t talk about safety and transparency um, so when uh, we have a, a bug in an open source model uh, if someone is is, is um, is setting that bug, then uh, if it is accepted, it will be uh, taken into the open source model, and with that, the open source model becomes better. And now, we're, if we're talking about uh, pre-trained models, the question is, uh, we're coming back to the discussion of feedback mechanism, how these feedback mechanisms are going to work, uh, and who is going to decide when uh, and when a model needs to be retrained or, or um, you know, it needs to be aligned. Uh, so I think that we have to think irrespectively of it, if we're having more closed or open source models to discuss um, on how to, to make uh, our infrastructure in general more resilient. I think we discussed, uh, Sebastian mentioned the digital infrastructure. I think that all infrastructure needs to be uh, more resilient because with open source model, it was mentioned before, you can also innovate uh, badly. So you can also innovate uh, by uh, bringing up new model, new ways of uh, designing microorganisms uh, or new weapons. So uh, I think that we uh, seriously have to invest in more resilience, uh, both in our technical infrastructure as well as our social infrastructure to also um, defend our institutions. 
Um, and I think one way of doing this is, of course, to, um, to have these benchmarks that we all discussed, the testing mechanism, the standards, and so on, because ultimately it's going to be um, it, it's going to be uh, public and private actors that are incorporating these open source models into their products and services. So we need to make sure that before we are doing that, that uh, these testings also take place. Um, I think that we also have to have new things. We need to have early warning systems. Uh, so uh, early warning systems on um, you know, what kind of developments are taking place, even, even whistleblower mechanisms that I, I think is going to be important to develop. Um, and, I, I, um, and also a new thing around, we know that uh, all systems are going to fail. And I think that with, when it comes to AI, we also have to think about having uh, systems that fail safe, safely. Okay. And um, Clara, I'll have to stop you yes. there. So. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for all those ideas. Um, so our next contributor is uh, Benoit Bergeret, uh, Executive Director of the Meta Lab at the ESSEC Business School. Thank you, Stuart. Um, hi, everybody. Very honored to be here. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to comment not so much on benefits of Scenario 2, because uh, I think they're easy to understand, but on two critical issues um, that I want to bring attention to. The risk brought by excessive reliance on open-sourced corporate AI research and the potential disenfranchising impact of AI applications on the workforce and society, both of which I think are especially uh, uh, prevalent in this uh, Scenario 2. The current reliance on corporate AI innovation raises significant questions about the alignment of technological progress with the public interest, especially in an open source diffusion modality. It's very important to understand, though, that open source innovation in AI is mostly limited, and I know this is going to trigger some comments, uh, to usage level innovation, applications of models to certain cases. But deep innovations, such as deep learning itself or the transformer architecture, did not stem from open source innovation, and I doubt that it can come from open source uh, and an open source ecosystem. But deep innovation is vital for beneficial and sustained AI diffusion. Uh, so if we allow narrow access to deep innovation, uh, we could witness a slowing down of usage level innovation and innovation going away from the public interest to back towards private interest and an healthy concentration of power as we described in scenario one. So it would be scenario two folding into scenario one. My second point is the rate at which AI is reshaping the job market. Um, the acceleration of AI deployment uh, could make us unable to provide new employment opportunities or retraining in a timely manner. This applies to a lot of professional roles with people holding them, risking facing significant economic strain, identity blur, and existential fears. And this discontent that could rise could uh, give rise to a backlash against the very innovation and possibly, some people say, a rise in populist votes and other impacts on our democracy. So what actions must we must take in 45 seconds? I believe that it's imperative that governments intensify their investment in AI research and development, committing to open source diffusion, balancing corporate interest at a level that must be on par in terms of output to the investment made by private companies. And then it is essential to enact strategic workforce development and support proactively. That goes through detailed qualitative and quantitative assessments of how automation may reshape various sectors and proactive measures to facilitate retraining, with a particular focus on roles that are less susceptible to automation, such as manual job, personal care, professions, etc. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, the, uh, the next presenter will be Marco Krobelnik from uh, the Josef Stefan Institute in Slovenia. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, many things can, have been said already, right? So, uh, not to uh, replicate uh, the points uh, of previous speakers, right? So, I would highlight one thing which uh, kind of relates to previous uh, talk. So uh, open source and development of LLMs for academia. Uh, so after this uh, ChatGPT moment a year ago and development of these large language models in during 2023 this year, uh, 
I feel a lot of confusion, right, in among academics because uh, we, so I'm one of them, we stayed kind of out of the game. We, we just, uh, <laughs> now we are users of somebody else's technology and uh, observing what's happening, right? Uh, so uh, this doesn't mean that their AI is bigger than this, right? But current hype uh, suggests that, uh, well, if you, we want a second, Acad uh, academic people want to be part of it, we simply cannot be, right? Uh, so this is one uh, one thing which, uh, well, open source helps a little bit, but still, uh, since these uh, large foundational models or LLMs are a matter of big infrastructure, um, yeah, ac academics are a little bit out of the game. So this is something which I would underline. But uh, on kind of related note, right? Uh, since we talk about the futures, right, so, and foresight. So I would say um, uh, there will be a time, and it might, might, might happen like within a year from now or sooner, that uh, we will stop talking about uh, LLMs and large uh, language models, um, which are, and th this technology will become an infrastructure for something else. And this something else, we touched already in the previous session, uh, could be this distributed AI. Uh, like agent-based architectures, which uh, will just leverage uh, all the capacities which are coming from, well, foundational models, LLMs, and so on. And um, mm, so this technology, current technology, which is kind of on the top of the hype, hype cycle, will become more like an infrastructure for something else, right? So uh, if we talk... Uh, about open source models, obviously this is democratization and so on, but also this agent-based architectures, distributed AI uh, will be further uh, democratization of AI, uh, which effectively means that uh, uh, there will be even more friction taken out of the AI ecosystem, right? Uh, which will, well, we can say lead towards democratization, but possibly even to anarchy of um, AI. So this is, would be next step from democratization. So uh, just to conclude, right? So uh, um, uh, in principle, I, I, I see this as a future, uh, so some kind of this emergent AI behavior, right? Which will be even way harder to regulate and control as, uh, uh, as we discuss now. So most of the discussions which are among the regulators and uh, even us here in, in at OECD is about current generative AI. So we should think and look at the time uh, beyond this. And it seems like that uh, this is coming soon. Maybe just the reference to the Monday's announcement from OpenAI, which goes exactly in this direction. This is uh, this uh, concept which they introduced, GPTs, right? Where pretty much in few days there was huge uptake of this sort of agents, right? Agents which talk to each other, uh, which don't need much interoperability in the standard sense. Uh, uh, yeah, so this seems like an extremely exciting, uh, but also a different type of discussion which we have uh, recently. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so now I think we move to people who are online, beginning with Effie Vajena from uh, ETH Zurich. Effie, are you there? Are you on mute? Okay, we'll move to Graham Taylor from the Vector Institute. Thanks for the opportunity to present. In my view, the, rising, uh, the rise of open source AI represents one of the most significant developments in the history of technology, uh, akin to the early days of the internet. Uh, this movement is democratizing access to cutting edge AI, it's breaking down barriers and enabling a global community of innovators. So this scenario two that we're talking about highlights a mix of potential benefits and risks. I firmly believe that the advantages of open source AI in terms of fostering innovation and inclusivity substantially outweigh the challenges. So embracing open source AI is not just a choice, but it's a necessity for driving technological progress. And the notion of prohibiting open source foundation models seems not just impractical, but counterproductive in our rapidly evolving AI landscape, as Marco just pointed out. Yeah. History has repeatedly okay. shown us that 
innovation flourishes in open environments. And just like Linux, which has been referred to several times, revolutionized computing, open source AI is paving the way for unprecedented advancements. So the real game changers in AI will likely stem from downstream applications and fine tuning by a diverse global community. We need to foster an ecosystem where AI is accessible to all. And by doing this, we'll ensure that innovation is not limited by geography or economic status. It will enable a truly global impact. In our pursuit of open source AI, managing risks effectively is crucial. And I particularly like the perspective offered by Tim Wu, who wrote in the New York Times this week, we must guard against sensationalist fears and focus on realistic concerns. It's imperative that we develop a regulatory framework which prioritizes targeted monitoring and intervention in specific harmful applications, such as human impersonation, which we know um, is directed most of the time at women and girls, as well as addiction. That's also been referred to earlier today. Uh, this approach will effectively mitigate risks without stifling the incredible potential of open source AI. Uh, and we also need to consider the global implications of our actions. So leading uh, in open source will place OECD members at the forefront of tech advancement and prevent others from dominating this crucial area. I've been experimenting with open local models since the release of the first Llama variants in early February. And from my personal perspective, having closely observed the rapid evolution of open source models since that time, I'm convinced that open source AI is not just a trend, but a paradigm shift that's already occurred in the field. Much of the dialogue is about uh, open models spoken in hypotheticals, um, but to borrow from a discussion earlier this week at the Creative uh, Destruction Reading Group, uh, Josh was there, um, the open source genie is out of the bag. Local models are in broad use now and their capabilities have grown considerably in recent weeks, narrowing the gap between 7 billion parameter models and the 30 billion or 70 billion parameter variants, also narrowing the gap between open models and proprietary commercial models. So governments and policymakers must recognize- Yep, last sentence. Um, and, and governments uh, need to enact laws that specifically target misuse of AI rather than imposing broad sweeping bans on the technology itself. Thanks. Okay, um, so our next contributor is Yosha Bach. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, after the stable diffusion rates were released, I uh, was contacted by two mathematics students that sat at the kitchen table in Bogota and had developed a new way to uh, get the diffusion model to produce uh, an image, not in 30 seconds, but in one second. And uh, they started a company out of this, with, uh, out an open source release of the rates. This would not have been possible. I think that this uh, decentralized uh, development that is possible outside of a few academic labs and uh, some large companies is enabling enormous progress. And uh, this needs to be balanced against uh, the fear that we might have of harms. Um, existential risks might be a completely different topic, but I don't uh, see them uh, manifest in the current generation of models. I think that the uh, innovation of use cases uh, is something that is important to transcend inefficient parts of our economies, news industries, education system, and so on, by enabling new um, technologies. In every technological revolution, jobs disappear, but this does not lead to impoverishment of large groups of people, but to more wealth, because more goods and services are produced and distributed, more high quality jobs emerge in novel fields. And we don't know whether AI is going to change this, but I think it's unlikely that this is the first technology of this kind that is going to make the world worse, because we can produce more um, and distribute more. Uh, I think if we want to have an alternative to a combination of corporate and govern, uh, governmental AI, uh, that is personal AI, citizen AI, we require open source AI. Outlawing open source will make it very hard for people to give them individual AI, allows them to do things. I think that uh, there are risks of uh, bad actors, of course, and some of the scenarios might be overblown, as such as bio risk, but others are underblown or completely unanticipated. There are probably risks from fintech and so on that we're not really seeing yet. Uh, but in many ways, the solution to uh, a bad guy uh, with an AI is going to be many good guys with AI. 
and uh, in a way in which we can, for instance, uh, leverage uh, AI to produce disinformation on the internet, we can uh, also use AI to understand the state of the world much, much better and to trace the provenance of information for secure bad actors and so on. But the regulation in this case should mostly not uh, outlaw the technology itself, but it should uh, state what is illegal and then uh, clearly go after those things that are illegal. Uh, in the world where we have no open source AI, we have much more likely a situation where companies will preemptively try to make use cases illegal that are touchy or that could be touchy. For instance, if pornography is not illegal, it, uh, we still find a situation where uh, it will be impossible to produce pornography with um, a generative AI. Or uh, when, say, discussion of medical results or of vaccination or of political events is not illegal, uh, there might be a push within companies and uh, um, AI regulation um, or non-regulation bodies that happen basically informally to make such use cases impossible. And this might not always be desirable in a democratic, open, uh, innovative society. I do think that this does not mean that uh, uh, open source should not be supervised or regulated. The regulation should... Uh, uh, Richard, sorry, yes. you're, you're over time already. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. It's all, all super interesting, but we, we have a... a oh, thanks. Thank all you. ...scenario to, to yes, get... Yes, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think uh, Roman was on the list, but is not here. I, is Effie... Uh, Effie, are you online? I guess not. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for all the super valuable contributions. And I will now turn it over to Michael. Well, th thank you, but not for long, because as some of you may know, um, Stuart is one of the um, protagonists in uh, the debate that I think has informed the next scenario. So uh, I'll, I'll play it directly back to you um, for a three minute <laughs> uh, intervention. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so scenario three, uh, is about regulators fearing that systems are about to uh, go beyond human control and trying to pull the plug. Um, and the the wording is that they fear that a critical safety threshold could be passed. Uh, and we see this uh, a lot, this, this idea that there's a threshold that we can somehow stipulate numerically, whether it's in compute or data or uh, or some combination of those. Um, but I think it's actually going to be very difficult for regulators to say uh, that a, a given system presents that type of threat. Uh, because although we do, uh, at the moment, uh, we train uh, monolithic models, those models are very quickly turned into components for more complex systems. Uh, so there are many, many projects that are building agents, uh, sometimes out of entire committees of large language models. Um, and so uh, I actually feel that if we were in the situation described, it would be extraordinarily difficult for regulators to make the determination. Um, and so we really don't want to be in this position at all. Um, and the way I usually put it is, that before we build systems that are more powerful uh, than ourselves, we have to figure out how to solve the control problem. Uh, that clearly has to come first. Um, and if we do it the other way around, it's going to be too late. And so that's why the scenario gets described. Uh, it seems like an already hopeless situation. And the only way I think we can ensure that we solve the control problem first is that um, regulations are put in place to uh, effectively enforce that developers solve uh, the safety problems that their systems might cause first, as we do for uh, pharmaceuticals and aviation and nuclear power. Um, the developers have to demonstrate to the regulator uh, analytically uh, that their system is going to be safe. So there's a, there's a, uh, a mathematical connection between the evidence they present and the claim that the system is necessarily safe. And people are accepting this. Developers, uh, some of the main AI companies are beginning to accept this, but they're saying, uh, let's wait 
until our systems are superhuman before we worry about having to prove safety. Uh, it seems to me this is completely backwards. We should prove safety for simple systems first. Uh, if those systems are safe, it should be easy to prove that they're safe. And if they're not safe, then we've already crossed a threshold. Uh, and so we should do it that way. Um, I just want to make one more point in my minus 10 seconds um, that if we took the scenario literally, we would have to have put in place already mechanisms to detect uh, this, uh, this risk that was emerging, to decide that enforcement has to take place. And we would have to have mandated an operable off switch for systems, both closed source systems or open source systems. And so although open source has some advantages that were described, uh, it, it's going to need to make sure that every copy can be switched off centrally uh, if that system starts to present serious risks. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. And with that, I would uh, move on to Joshua Bengio, who I have next on my list. Joshua, over to you. Yes, uh, let me start my timer. So um, I, I want to start by connecting the previous scenario to this one. Um, and clarifying, contrary to some of the things that have been said uh, here and elsewhere, that there is no known way to make open source models uh, safe. Um, the current protections can easily be taken off, as been shown by two recent papers, for example, with very little work. That means open source models, and you know, until some like incredible discovery happens, cannot be regulated once shared. And of course, bad actors will not follow any kind of regulation. Once they have access, it's too late. Um, so this would be irresponsible as we approach a more and more uh, capable systems. Um, so what can we do? Um, well, we, we can have alternatives to open source and um, uh, we need to make sure that uh, we, you know, whatever is done is um, uh, uh, you know, providing some of the democratic advantages like democratic oversight and robustness to safety failures, for example, with sandboxes or uh, 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 limited access to trustworthy researchers like BSL4 labs and, and biology. Um, um, so, in terms of deciding, you know, when to pull the plug, what, what's the, you know, how do we decide? I think there's a big mistake right now that we are uh, asking governments to come up with these tests and benchmarks to prove that a system, to find whether a system is safe and then to pull the plug if it's uh, deemed not safe. But this is, I think, the wrong way of doing it. Uh, these systems should be guilty until proven otherwise. In other words, the burden should be on companies to demonstrate that their systems are safe, such that you know independent scientists like myself could check and say, yes, the argument is sound, just like we do for drugs or building planes or trains or bridges. Um, now, what about um, countries where those kinds of regulations are not present, like maybe um, uh, you know, uh, state actors that don't follow the OECD uh, recommendations. Well, we need to deal with that too. We need to make sure that we work on agreements um, with all countries and um, just what like we've done with other dangerous technologies uh, where uh, we want to avoid uh, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. And for countries that don't agree to follow those um, safety protocols, and um, we should have some sort of penalties, maybe economic, uh, to make sure uh, as much as possible we uh, uh, obtain uh, safety. But, you know, it's not going to be perfect. We have to live with the fact that uh, some countries will maybe sign those treaties, uh, but cheat behind closed doors. And so we have to also prepare for, um, you know, these cases with countermeasures. I'll paste uh, a paper in Journal of Democracy that I wrote about this. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, Toby Ord next on my list from the University of Oxford. Toby, are you online? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so I want to focus my remarks on the criteria for, for pausing frontier development. So there's been a lot of recent discussion uh, about responsible scaling policies or RSPs. And these are policies developed by AGI companies that are voluntary at first, uh, but have the potential to act as a model for regulation. Uh, they break the path in to AGI into stages of increasingly dangerous capabilities, where in order to train and deploy systems at each of these uh, levels, appropriate safeguards for that level would be needed. 
uh, you could think of this as a structured set of pauses, which say that if we get to a certain point uh, before having the needed safety mechanisms, that we'd have to pause until those mechanisms are developed. Uh, the idea is to avoid premature regulation by allowing the systems to move forward right up to the edge, but no further. Um, so that's one way we could get a pause, a somewhat orderly pause uh, where a pre-declared danger threshold is met. Uh, another way, of course, would be if there was a sudden catastrophic outcome of some sort uh, where we would have a disorderly pause. Um, I wanted to mainly point out that in either of those cases, we pause just in time or just uh, just after the right time. Uh, but either way, people are just shy of possessing extremely powerful and catastrophically dangerous systems. Uh, at that point, it would be extremely difficult to prevent actors taking the final step. So right now, uh, to reach such capabilities, we still need to put in billions of dollars of funding with years of research by hundreds of top researchers using chips that haven't yet been developed. Uh, but if we paused at a point where another year of work by a single team with their existing computers could get those capabilities, there would be a lot of incentive to clandestinely take that final step and verification of a global pause would be extremely hard. Uh, an analogy to nuclear weapons, I think, is, is useful. If we were to pause nuclear uh, at the point uh, where a whole Manhattan project by world-leading scientists spending 1% of the US GDP was still required, that may have put a large enough chasm in place to not get nuclear weapons. Um, but if we'd paused at the point where all the theory and engineering had been worked out, then it wouldn't be. Um, so I just wanted to really point out that while a just-in-time pause of the type that's described would be the most efficient thing, uh, I worry that going right up to the edge before pausing would give a pause that just won't hold. Uh, instead, we'd need to pause prior to the last minute to be workable, uh, and that that would ultimately involve giving up some efficiency uh, in order to get a robustly working policy in the first place. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to Sean O'Higgerty. Uh, Sean, are you online? I am, yes. Great. Um, I agree with a lot of the points that um, Stuart, Yoshua, and Toby have made. I agree that it's going to be very difficult both to know when we're at that threshold and to take action. In terms of thinking about criteria, um, I think one thing would be, so one could imagine sort of capabilities that you might see that would be a cause for concern, such as strategic planning, autonomy, or ability towards deceit that were considerably ahead of systems we currently have. One could also think in terms of kind of a specific risk outcome. So um, if a system was being developed that demonstrated that it was capable of large scale cyber attacks in a way that was going to be very, very difficult to defend against, that would seem to satisfy um, a criteria for a pause as well. One thing I think might be quite helpful is to have a relatively broad range of criteria that might trigger such a pause that could be pre-agreed in the way that Toby mentioned, because when we're on the edge of this thing, it's not the time to be having a lot of back and forth debates on whether this is the right time to pause or not. There needs to be some sort of prior commitment. With that said, having a broad enough set of criteria that might trigger that allows you to not have to predict every single type of um, thing that might cross that threshold because we might not be able to predict it ahead of time. And if you have a relatively broad set, you can then see that a capability that is developed might um, sort of meet the kind of broad sense of this criteria, even if it isn't something that um, we've specifically predicted in advance. Um, but yeah, it's going to be difficult. Um, in terms of just going through the questions, um, what would be needed to um, make this happen, to implement an order? I think you do need to have some sort of um, pre-commitments at an international level that would be enforced by regulations at a national level. You'd need to have regulators or auditors, <laughs> members of oversight bodies working very closely with leading research hubs, as well as oversight of key infrastructure, such as major, major computing clusters. Um, government leaders would need to be bought in, and there's going to be some difficult judgment calls. Um, so I agree with Toby's point that you don't want to wait until the very last minute to institute such a pause. However, even for a temporary pause, I think the 
global community doesn't get to make this kind of call too often and get it clearly wrong. So while you wouldn't want to leave the last minute, you wouldn't want to be sort of overcautious and be calling for a pause quite regularly because it might um, erode the ability to actually get agreement around these things. One thing that uh, we haven't really touched on yet, although I think no, I don't think we've really touched on is the question of what's necessary to ensure sufficient global agreement. And the scenario highlights that there's some sort of agreement amongst OECD countries around this. There isn't um, with the BRICS countries who are not very far behind. And um, I guess Toby alluded to this, but you do have then this problem that a whole set of countries do decide to institute a moratorium, but that only really buys you the time until other actors catch up to that frontier. And so there's a big question about what you do there. I mean, one thing I think is those OECD countries would need to demonstrate very, very clearly that they actually are instituting this pause and that they have very good reason for it and that it's not posturing or it's not some sort of effort to slow down the um, progress of competitors. Um, and they're going to need to demonstrate why they're doing it, and that's going to need some sorts of demonstrations. Now, obviously, the ideal thing would be not to get into this multipolar situation in the first place and to look to get agreements at a global um, level instead. But um, this is a scenario we're in, and let's try not to get into it. I'm probably at my three minutes, so I'll stop. Thank you. Um... I have one more participation online. That would be Marcus uh, <laughs> Underlung from the uh, Center for the Governance of AI. Marcus, are you there? I'm here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I thought I would focus on a sub question here on, on a sort of a more, a more narrow question. So basically, assuming that it would be desirable to put in place such a moratorium on, on sort of developing the most advanced systems, um, say there were you know models that could pose catastrophic or maybe existential risks. Would that be possible? Um, I think that the answer to that question is is yes, at least provided three conditions hold. So there would need to be sufficient political will and sort of consensus that this, this sort of risk exists. It would have to be the case that the riskiest systems require a huge amount of computational power to be trained and the compute supply chain remains concentrated. Um, and I think those things might might actually end up holding. So the most advanced uh, and high risk AI systems currently are, are and and sort of at least my belief would be sort of will likely continue to be the ones that are trained with the most computational power uh, and the supply chain for for such compute is incredibly concentrated um they you know the, the most advanced systems they will require tens of thousands of uh, of chips um that are designed by about two to three companies in the world built by one to two companies in the world in specific jurisdictions using semiconductor manufacturing equipment that sometimes is sort of developed or controlled by, by single companies. So in a world where there would be sort of consensus that the next generation of systems would lead to loss of human control or, or some other sort of large risk, I think it is that it's possible to, to control the, the development of such models. Um, now, I don't think such an arrangement would be able to last forever, or, and it wouldn't be foolproof. Um, creating and maintaining sort of an absolute threshold of, of sort of how much computational power you can use to train a model, I think would be very difficult. Um, hardware will continue to improve. Algorithms will become more efficient. Uh, smaller models might end up having a significant impact as well. Um, and so I think instead the way to, to look at this is that you're sort of buying time uh, with, with such a moratorium um, to, to learn how to develop safer systems and also to increase society's ability or sort of resilience uh, to be able to live in a world where, where with sort of more of these more of these capable models. Um, to sort of analogize this, I like the analogy of, of sort of thinking about this as sort of traversing sort of a minefield. Um, so we need to sort of initially put lots of effort into making sure that we identify mines before anyone sort of steps on them. Um, but the job isn't done there. Once we found these mines, uh, the systems that could sort of cause significant risk, potential loss of controls, et cetera, um, we need to make sure that others don't step on them. So that could be the, the moratorium. But that wouldn't be enough because someone eventually would end up stepping on the mine, maybe due to recklessness, maybe due to sort of sheer malice. Um, and so we need to work on disarming the mines as well, making sure that society is robust to very powerful, potentially misaligned systems being developed and, and deployed into the world. Uh, and so that might look like making sure that you have a, a large or, or a significant number of powerful but clearly aligned AI systems that can sort of help society, help the world be able to sort of uh, sort of defend against these sort of more uh, more misaligned ones. 
All right, thank you very much. And with that, we move to uh, contributions from here in the room. I have first on my list, uh, Duncan, over there. Oh. Okay, thank you. Well, delighted to be back at the OECD, uh, this time on this side of the table. Um, so the first comment I would make on this scenario is that it may be actually sooner than we'd expect, sooner than we'd like. Uh, we've known for a long time that scientists may be capable at some point of creating AI systems that are so powerful that they might lose control of those systems. The question has been, when do we start to need, need to start worrying about this? And what we're hearing now from the leading AI scientists around the world who are working most closely with these systems is that the time to be concerned is now. So what should the trigger be towards before we actually take substantial action like that's suggested in this scenario. And I think this is the trigger ultimately needs to be capabilities based. What are the capabilities that we would be, we would not want AI systems to have because we would be concerned that we would not be able to control them and they could create harm with, that, with those capabilities. Now, uh, whatever these capabilities might be defined as, uh, autonomous self-replication is one that's often given, but there are a whole list of them and we need to do the roll up the sleeves hard work, which I think a number of you around the table are actually doing of identifying those, defining them and, and uh, identifying the, the ways of measuring those and giving us sort of the, the alarm uh, warning when we are getting close. I think that relying on measures such as number of parameters or, or flops and so forth is risky. It is we have the potential to see discontinuous changes suddenly uh, that could lower the amount of compute needed to create very capable models. We need to have those. We need to be prepared for those scenarios. We need, um, uh, as Toby was mentioned, we want a, a buffer, a safety buffer here. We don't want it to be going right up to the edge. Uh, as, as much as that, you know, might be efficient. Um, so then the question is, what is the system that we will actually want? Well, I think I'd like to emphasize, first of all, that, you know, counter to the title of this scenario, this is definitely not about pull the plug. Uh, we are, are not trying to stop all AI progress. Regulation and risk management needs to be proportionate to the risk. This is a core principle. There are a number of AI systems that likely don't need any regulation at all. There are a certain number that, that have high impacts on societies and that will require regulation, but that there's going to be a trade-off between the benefits and the risks. And then I think there's some a category of these truly global risk um, systems where we are going to, where really we need to, uh, as Stuart was mentioning, flip the burden of proof, where it needs to be, no, you don't get permission with your, in the licensing regime to create one of these models until you can demonstrate that we can comfortably uh, rely on them being, being safe. So finally, this leads to the question of like who decides. And the situation we're in now is, I think, one of the greatest injustices and human rights issues that we're facing in the world. And that is namely that there are a small number, a handful of people and a handful of, of companies that are making decisions that are ultimately putting at risk the lives and the livelihoods of people around the world. Now, this, their efforts are likely highly well-intentioned, but these people don't have the expertise nor the legitimacy to be making that kind of risk assessment that affects all of the global community. And so I think clearly we are going to need a decision-making uh, that is a, an effective, globally effective and legitimate system for decision making, but then ultimately also for implementation and enforcement, such as monitoring adherence. So I conclude by saying that we don't need global agreement on all or even most aspects of AI governance, but we will need it when it comes to the greatest national security and loss of control risks that could affect all of humanity. Thanks. Thank you, Duncan. Um, we'll move on to Ziv um, from the uh, National Plan for AI in uh, Infrastructure at Israel's Innovation Authority. Over to you. Well, thank you. Um, I'll try and make three very quick observations. Uh, first one is that loss of control um, should primarily be associated with people and not with machines. So the scenario assumes that we have this super intelligent machine and that it tries to take control over humanity and so on and so forth. But the uh, fact is that most catastrophic or even most harmful events that we see around us are the result of the deeds of people. And so to me, whatever tools we decide to choose eventually, uh, we should aim those to uh, the way people use technology and not to the technology itself. Second thing is, and this was expressed many times during the last few weeks, I think, um, people treat 
loss of control or the potential for a catastrophic event as kind of a, a binary thing, right? I've reached this certain capacity and all of a sudden my model can create catastrophic events, but prior to that it couldn't. And to me, we should look at, at it kind of a grayscale approach as, as opposed to a binary approach, right? There are many catastrophic or terrible things that can happen with current day's models, right? And so um, trying to measure whether, I don't know, I reach a certain amount of parameters in my model or I use this amount of compute or this amount of data. Um, I think that this kind of shifts our focus away from where we should be. So that's uh, comment number two. Thirdly, I think that a moratorium might be a good idea in certain, uh, in certain situations, but that we should understand that it's a temporary solution. It's not, it's not a permanent solution, right? It can buy us time, but eventually no one has ever been able to stop technological research and advancement. And so if you reach this point, we say, guys, this is too risky and we want to buy a little bit of time for regulators, for private sector, for public sector, for everybody else to try and devise a solution, that's a good idea. But uh, we cannot hope to use it for a prolonged period of time because some other countries, some other people will simply use it uh, for us. So that be me. Thank you. Thank you, Ziv. Um, I then have uh, Pam Dixon uh, next on the list. Pam, uh, over to you. Thanks so much. This has been interesting. Um, so I have a couple of thoughts to, to talk with you about. So first, um, I really, we need to assume that smaller models could be really catastrophic, but not in ways that we typically expect. So if you think through the financial and health sectors, which are connected in very intriguing and difficult ways, it wouldn't be that difficult with the models that exist today to create a lot of problems. We've got to be aware of that. And then in terms of regulation, I would posit to you that um, based on what we've seen with global regulatory schema for the past, what, 50, 60, 70 years, there's not a regulatory system in place right now that would be sufficient to fully ban or stop these models. I propose to you the data protection and data governance regulations, which exist in 163 jurisdictions. Even with that level of footprint, there is regulatory escape, and it is meaningful regulatory escape. So we need to be more humble about our capability to find solutions with what we know right now. So to mitigate this, I think that what we need to do is be much more open to um, all members of society and the world and talk with them and, and really discover new solutions that have not been constructed before. So let me just try to get a little more basis in reality for that statement. So um, nuclear regulatory models have been proposed as one potential for mitigating this risk. But this particular model relies on sparsity of the technologies and materiel to build those models. That's a real problem in this use case, where we have profusion of a technology and the potential for a uh, concentration of small bits of technology to have outsized effects. And we also have a real problem because some jurisdictions which already have the technology may not really care so much about their own survival and may be willing to inflict significant damage just for the fun of it. So if we want to mitigate these difficult things, we need now to work very hard to begin to understand what we don't know right now. I haven't heard a great solution yet, and I certainly don't have any that are perfect. So why is it that we would not want to work cooperatively with all jurisdictions to find ways of including all jurisdictions, even the most problematic, because they will continue to be problematic? There is a system called the GLIFE system, which is a global legal um, identifier system. Even one incursion into that system could create fiscal chaos everywhere. So we, we need to talk to everyone. We need to cooperate, and we're going to have to do it sooner rather than later. I don't believe that we're, you know, tomorrow, or I don't know when there would be a difficult time. But what I do know is that 
we are not humble enough and we need to search for solutions and we need to find them by walking across the, the river and feeling the stones under our feet and really searching like researchers and, and very carefully exploring options but based in fact and testing our, our facts against reality. I will close with this. Eleanor Ostrom, the, uh, the Nobel laureate said, if it works in practice, it will work in theory. So we need to step out of theory, move into practice and work there to find solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, for that contribution. So um, I would at this point uh, like to ask if there's any further members of the expert group who would like to comment uh, or have a question, remarks at this point. If that's not the case, then I think we might have time to see if there's a question um, coming from the online um, participants as well. Is there anything, Jamie, at this point? No. All right. In that case, um, I thank you very much for the exchange so far, and I'll hand over to Stuart, um, who wanted to wrap up today's discussion. Stuart, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Um, this has been uh, a great discussion. I really look forward to uh, going over the recording and making more detailed notes of everyone's points. Um, and uh, I appreciate that it's been very constructive. People have sort of argued their uh, their case without necessarily trying to shoot down other people, and that uh, that's good to hear. Um, so uh, I think. The discussion we're having is very timely. In fact, it's sort of really, although this is sort of scenario generation about the future, uh, a lot of it is very real and uh, and happening right now. Uh, and uh, governments are really open and listening and asking uh, asking experts. Uh, the sort of one of the reasons why we're here, right? They're they're asking experts uh, what to do. And um, the sooner we can come to uh, agreed and sensible conclusions about that, the better. Um, I'm sure many of you have lots more to say. I have a lot more to say on many of these questions. Um, so on behalf of my co-chairs uh, and the OECD, I'd like to thank everyone for participating today uh, and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>